Amen. Wasn't that fun? I was going to wait and see if the giant would come tumbling down. <laughs> if he would do. That song comes with motions, you know. Thank you, Caleb. What a blessing. And yes, thank you to all of our members and friends and volunteers that help make every worship time here wonderful and special. I uh, appreciate everyone uh, who contributes and is a part of our service. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we just want to continue in this generous spirit and this openness of heart. So, Lord, as we now move into the message, I pray that it would be your voice heard in every heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you again and have another opportunity to study God's Word and to learn from from Him today. I, I am going to uh, stay in the series a few weeks longer and uh, on faith, and I, I spent the last couple weeks uh, tying character in and how character matters to our faith development and reflecting on uh, character. And now I'm moving uh, back into different elements of our faith and why they matter. And so for today, I'm going to be talking about the parousia. And now, that may not be a word you use regularly, and I specifically used it to make it kind of veiled what the topic was going to be. Um, this is the Greek word uh, that is most commonly used to refer to the second coming of Christ. It means the coming or the presence. It has a dual meaning in Greek, and it's a fascinating thing that uh, it can mean both the presence uh, and, and longing for the presence of God, but it also has the uh, idea and the specific meaning of the coming of Christ, the coming of Christ. There's three principal Greek words that are used, uh, but this is the primary uh, word. There's other phrases and metaphors and analogies, of course, dozens upon dozens. Uh, but uh, when you're studying at a, a uh, significant level, the origins and depth of the doctrine of the second coming, the word parousia is uh, very important. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And before I go to the kids' quiz, I just want to share this verse from James uh, to kind of begin the dialogue. James tells us, now, I, I find it fascinating to always remind myself that James was the brother of Jesus. I grew up, I never really uh, thought about it. I just assumed when I came to the, the book of James that he was an apostle like all the other apostles. You know, Peter was an apostle and John was an apostle. James was not an apostle. Uh, he was the brother, the elder brother of Jesus and, it, and originally somewhat of a doubter. But uh, I, that's kind of an aside note here. I just always find it very interesting that the uh, brother of Jesus would say the words um, uh, as we read in the book of James. But anyways, coming toward the end of his uh, epistle, he uses these, uh, these phrases and these words. Therefore, be patient. And I am identifying the number of times he says it. That's the first time. Be patient, brethren, until the parousia, the coming of the Lord. The parousia of the curios, the coming of the Lord. And he uses an, an analogy. The farmer waits, and that's actually another term for patience, waiting. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it. That's the second time he's used the word patience, until it gets the early and latter rains. You too be patient. That's three times uh, in a row. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Isn't that interesting? The coming of the Lord is is near. The nearness or the expectancy of Christ's return was just as real, was just as vibrant to the apostles and to the first generation of the church and Christians as it is today. And that, that draws a, a great interest of curiosity of, of how that means as time has gone on for thousands of years since then. And we've seen all the, uh, the events of the world ebb and flow. But I want to just, uh, again, I will have the kids quiz here in a, in, in a second. Um, as I have preached and gotten to know the congregation, there's an element of scriptural truth that fascinates me, and I, I share it from time to time, and that's the paradoxes. I love the biblical paradoxes. If you want to be first, you got to be last. If you want to be wise, you got to be a fool. Right? All these seemingly opposites that are true at the same time. And we find one of those paradoxes 
uh, when we study the doctrine of the second coming, because at the same time that you have uh, the, uh, the truth of we need to be alert, we need to be ready. There's lots of scriptural passages about the nearness and the, the readiness, and it could happen at any moment. You have at the same time uh, uh, the, the, uh, the advice as James gives us here that we need to be patient. We need to be patient. And so we live in this tension between two worlds of being patient as the farmer. You know, there's only so much you can do. You can, you can do what God has asked you. You can plant. You can water. But you've got to wait until God's timing brings, uh, brings the, the produce. Okay? So you have that element of being patient, but you also have that truth and reality that is just as important about we need to be ready at any moment. And that's an interesting dynamic to live in, to be patient and to be alert and ready. And that's really kind of what drives uh, the, the uh, angle of this message I'm going to give you uh, this morning. So, I, I don't know if this just isn't working, guys, or if you want to help me out. We'll see how it goes. Thank you so much. Um, so, I do want to help, have some help from our young people today as we talk about this vital elements of our faith. And I want to share with you, and this probably won't be very surprising, as I have done the different presentations on creation and, hi, Ketsia, are you just waving to me? I am so glad to see you too. Hi, Ketsia. Um, as I have done the different presentations on the Sabbath and the cross and creation, prophecy and these other things, there's just this element, and you probably experienced it, I would think, in, in your devotional and Bible study life at times. Whatever you happen to be focusing on at the moment, the Lord has a way of trying to make it feel like that's the most important thing in the world. And as I've gone through each of these different presentations, whether it's the Sabbath or about character or creation, I always find myself being, being like, this is the most important thing ever. This is so fundamental. This has to exceed and, and be superior to everything else. And I find myself, when we talk about the, uh, the reality of the second coming, it just screams from the pages of Scripture, you, we cannot avoid this. We must make this paramount in our uh, life. And that's uh, really what the whole point of the Faith Matters series is about. All right, question number one. When Jesus comes again, uh, who's going to see him? Are there any young people here with would, would like? Does anyone? Let, I don't see it. Oh, Ketsia. She did have her hand up first, guys. That's the first one I saw. So, Ketsia, and can I get um, one of those that are watching from home to be able to hear? Thank you, George. And actually having two mics would be just fine. Can we go green or green? Red and yellow. My, oh, my. Oh, Mark, thank you so very much. Ketsia, when, when George comes with the mic, uh, you help us out. Is everyone, maybe the Christians and Jews, Adventists, 144? A, everyone. A, everyone. You sure? Yeah, you know not everyone believes that, but that's what we certainly believe. Hey, look, uh, and just the passages, and there's dozens upon dozens of passages. Here Jesus says in Matthew 24, then all the tribes, all the tribes, all the peoples of the earth are going to experience and witness the coming of Christ are going to mourn because of that circumstance, and they will see the Son of Man coming. It seems pretty clear. Revelation, behold, He's coming in the clouds. And how many eyes are going to see Him? Every eye will see Him. And we can even go to the book of Acts where Jesus goes up in the clouds at His ascension, and the angels say, uh, brethren, this same Jesus who you have seen going up in the clouds, will return in the same way that you have watched him go. Now, I didn't grow up believing this. This is something I had to learn later on. I grew up in a different uh, spiritual context where we believed that Jesus' coming would be a secret. And I, there's reasons that they disrupt and take, take the Scriptures a, a different way. But I think when you put all the pieces together, you cannot escape, I think, the clear biblical message that Jesus' second coming is going to be glorious and un, impossible to not notice. All right, number two. When Jesus comes again, who will be with him? And I'm not going to give you, I just want to hear some answers on this. So I see some young people over here, George. Um, okay, that's Dylan, right? Dylan, my man. Dylan's going to help us out. And there's going to be some opportunities for other answers too. Right here, green shirt with the red, yeah. God? Okay, God, that's right. Jesus uh, says that the Son of Man will come seated at the right hand of power. Well, who's that power? That's definitely God the Father. All right, and then Sean? Oh, oh, right here up front, sure. Yes, young lady? Yes. Yes. 
I like that affirmation. Yes, yes, let your yes be yes. Um, Sean, uh, I think Sean had his hand up. Or do we have someone over here? Angels. All right, you see it right there in the picture. How many angels? All the angels, the Bible says, when the Son of Man is revealed with all the holy angels. Um, how many angels are there? Do we know? I know there's at least a dozen. I think there's quite a few. We, we don't know, but I think there's a, a many. Anyone else? Anyone else going to be with Jesus when he comes? Are, there are others if you think about it. Any young people want to hazard a guess? Let's put on the screen here what we got. We know the angels are going to be there. God the Father and God the Spirit. You know, it's not like uh, the third person of the Godhead will be uh, uh, not there. Okay, we got Caleb now. He's going to help us out here. Moses. Moses. And who, who do we think of with Moses possibly? Elijah. Moses and Elijah. You know, Jesus, when he has the transfiguration, he tells his apostles, some of you here are going to witness the coming of the Son of Man in his power. And then he has his transfiguration, and Moses and Elijah uh, appear as well. And you, you have to think to yourself, is it like God's going to leave them in heaven and say, hey, Moses, Elijah, I'm taking all the angels. We're about to go back to earth. You guys hold down the fort. Okay, and we'll be back. No, I think it's very clear that just as Moses and Elijah were with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, which Jesus himself says is a symbol of his second coming, that they will be with him as well. Okay, Anna? Enoch. Ha! Ah, you guys got them all. I'm so impressed. Again, I think, you know, there's a passage in Revelation that talks about heaven being silent for 30 minutes. Have you ever read that before? Heaven was silent for 30 minutes. And there are interpretations that suggest that the reason why heaven is silent at that moment is because no one's there. Because it's at that moment in prophetic uh, chronology that heaven empties out. They're all here. They're all here. Who's going to be left? Who's going to be sitting there? The whole purpose of eternity now turns on the experience of this moment. And I think, uh, I think everyone who's there will be here. Uh, and that includes those uh, resurrected at the time uh, that Christ uh, was resurrected. Remember that says that the tombs were opened. And then Ephesians says that he brought um, captives in his train when he went to heaven. So uh, others there as well. Okay, number three. When Jesus comes again, where will we meet him? And here are the options. Is it that place called the Mount of Olives in the air? Is it going to be your local church? Am I going to send out a text to everyone? Hey, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, Jesus, right? Will it be in the wilderness or maybe we'll all meet on Zoom? I see some. Okay, Owen hasn't answered yet, so let's go to Owen. In the air. He got it first off. You know, I tried to trick you there, but... Uh, you got it right. Um, this is very interesting, too. And again, we, we can't overemphasize or, or maybe lose the context of this. This is from this verse that we're very familiar with in Thessalonians. The Lord himself will descend from heaven, the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, all the loudness there. Not only will we see the second coming, it will reverberate in our brains because of the loudness. The dead in Christ rise. Those who are alive and remain will be caught up together. That's the word where rapture comes from. The word rapture is rarely never used in the scripture, but that's the idea of being caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. By the way, this is one simple test to know if someone's the Antichrist or not, or, or a false Messiah. Not an, I said that wrong. If someone's the false Messiah, which is a similar thing. If they're standing on terra firma, guess what? They ain't Jesus because the Bible makes it clear the next time we get to experience a personal connection with Jesus, it won't be here. We are going to meet him in the air. So anyone walking around on planet Earth saying, hey, guys, good news. I'm the Messiah. You say, well, brother, you're not. I think you're confused because Scripture makes it clear uh, we are not going to be uh, convening uh, in the way on Earth as Jesus did in his first coming. I think I have one more. 
When Jesus comes again, what will you do? What will you do? Be afraid? Ah, be brave. You're going to run and hide? You're going to be happy and rejoice? You're going to look away? Or are you going to look to him? Okay, I see Sebastian. Oh, and then um, Gio's over here. So, Mark, if you can grab Gio after we have Sebastian. Sebastian, what you got for us? Rejoice. Yay! I like that, Sebastian. Wonderful. Gio. Uh, rejoice. Okay. We can do it twice. That's allowed. Okay, we're going to have Dylan a chance again, and then Ketsia. Look to him. Look to him. I like it. I like it. And Ketsia. Thank you for our trained technical microphone operators. I'll do everything except for run and hide. You'll do them all? A little except bit of... for run and hide. Okay, no run and hide, but there's a little mixture of those other ones. All right, that's a fair and honest answer. I understand that. I, uh, I appreciate everyone participating. Thank you, George and Mark. I think that's where I draw it to close. So certainly there's a way of, of understanding all these things, but ultimately we want to be brave. We want to be able to rejoice, and then we want to look to him. You can just set it on the pew there. It'd be fine. This is one of my favorite of um, all the psalms. There's so many great psalms. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 34. So I thought in this context I would just share these few verses. I sought the Lord. He answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. When you think about prophecy and the second coming, there is a tendency at times to fear the persecution and, you know, am I ready and those things. But when we seek the Lord, we do not need to have fear. He delivered me from my, all my fears. And then I love verse 5. They looked to him and were radiant. Just as Moses was able to look at God and the glory of God radiated from him, their faces will never be ashamed. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The Lord is coming, amen? So important to us as a denomination, we embedded it into our very identity. We are seventh-day Adventists. It's not a common word we use anymore. Uh, we don't use the word Advent on a regular basis, but that's what the meaning uh, of the word is. The Advent is the event of the second coming. It's when the Lord returns. We are Seventh-day Adventists. Those two elements, I've already spoke on the Sabbath, and we could have many other discussions and learning moments on that, but so also is the reality of the parousia the Advent, the second coming, so important to us that we said we need to be known as a people of the Advent. Now, little children, abide in Him so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away in shame at His coming. I like this idea. If we want to have confidence and be ready, we just need to abide in Him now. We need to live in expectation. We need to live in, in relationship and in submission to who Jesus is. And as we grow to know Him, not only will we be ready for the Advent, we will understand deeper our responsibility to Him before He comes again. Before He comes again. I want to talk this morning a little bit about situational awareness. I learned situational awareness uh, playing baseball. Um, I loved playing baseball uh, as a kid. And uh, one of the lessons that you're taught in, in every sport, but uh, it came most dramatically in baseball, is you always need to know the situation, particularly on defense. If you're playing defense, how many outs are there? How many runners are on base? What inning is it? What's the score? You always needed to know if the ball comes to you, what do you do with it? Okay? Is, you know, do, you know what, is it going to be a double play? Is the ball in the air? Is it on the ground? What's the situation? And when you lose situational awareness, usually things don't result very well. And there was a particular game when I was 11 or 12 years old where I lost situational awareness. I love to play first base. Where's Taylor? Did he step out? Taylor, I played first base. I started out at second. Okay, 
Started out at second, but I always wanted to be involved in the game. I didn't want to be the, you know, the player that you can go almost the whole game and the ball never came to you once. So I worked my way into being a first baseman because I wanted to be involved. And so I love to play first base. And uh, there was a particular game. I was a, I was a St. Louis Cardinal. I, if I had time, if I had that extra day I was talking about earlier, I may have put some pictures up there for you, but <laughs> didn't have time. <laughs> Save that for another 11, 12 years old. The St. Louis Cardinal was our team. Um, and I was playing first base, and uh, it was getting toward the end of the game. And I knew this. I thought I knew this situation. It was a tight game, and there was a runner on third. Now, as a first baseman, one of the jobs is not let that runner on third score. So I knew if there was a ground ball to the infield and that they threw it to me, my next step was to get that guy at third. Or the guy, if the guy at third was trying to come home, I was going to throw him out. And man, I was ready. Ho oh, ho. I was ready. Man, if that guy on third tries to score, I am going to hose him. I am going to throw that ball. He is going to be sorry his mama ever met his daddy if he ever tries to. I watched a lot of TV growing up, okay? Uh, I, I was kind of, I was a little competitive, Dean Mark, just a little bit. Um, but I was ready. So sure enough, we're playing, and uh, the ball gets hit. It's a ground ball to the shortstop. Now, the shortstop was the best player on the team. Really good player, um, and uh, so he, ground, he, he gets the ball, and uh, he throws it to me. Now, as this is all happening, I see that runner on third take off. I see him heading down the third baseline, and I'm like, okay, it's on. It is on. He's going. So I take the pass, or the pass here, baseball. I take the throw. Ball hits me, and I just load up. I get, you know, get the out at first, got my foot on it, and I go, and I just get ready to throw. And I look down, and I didn't see what I expected to see. I expected to see the catcher, you know, like this. Like, come on, get it to me, because he's coming, you know. He, the, the catcher wasn't like that at all. As a matter of fact, the catcher wasn't looking at me at all. The catcher was kind of doing this. Now, you know how quickly the human brain can process, process data, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm poised. I am, you know, right here, and my eye sees the catcher, and I think, something's not right. And at the same moment, I notice the runner, who I was expecting to see, you know, just about going into their slide, I see the runner's kind of pulling up a little bit and slowing down before he gets to home plate. And at the very last second, it dawns on me. I just got the third out. But I was too far into my motion and could not stop. And so I, I remember this moment as though it happened yesterday, Edwin. I remember it in my little brain. I can see the colors. I can see the shadows. And I, I, I kind of yelled which actually didn't help the situation. I kind of went, ah! Or in slow-mo, And I, I probably took a little bit off the throw, but not a lot. I threw it pretty hard. But when I yelled, it actually made the situation worse. The catcher, if, let's say this is the plate, okay? The catcher is, is off, but the runner hears me yell and kind of looks up. Does anyone have a weak stomach? <laughs> the ball hit him right in the neck. And to this day, I can hear the, the thud of the ball. I can hear it. Uh, Taylor, would you come here for a second? No. <laughs> I don't need it. I can hear it. I can hear it as if it had just happened. That, you know, we've all, if you've seen baseball, you hear the ball hit but it hit him right in the neck. Now, it did not obviously hit him in the vocal cords because he collapsed and just was not a happy camper and is just writhing and crying. And I've seen ballistic moms before, but a ballistic mom, you know, got out and just babies dying and what, you know, um, I wouldn't be telling you this story if it didn't have at least somewhat of a uh, redeemable ending. Um, and, of course, everybody stops. It's like seeing a car wreck. You know, you can't, everyone, you know, the shortstop is like, what? The coaches, the, the umpires are like, oh, what do I, you know, and you're just processing it. Well, I mean, to make a long story short, 
um, you know, they get him up. He goes over to the bench, and he's consoling. But then I did what any normal 11 or 12-year-old would do. I collapsed in tears. <laughs> I thought I just killed a kid. You know, I thought I just really took him out. And, and uh, so I'm crying. I'm on the bench. And, of course, the game, you trying to figure out what the next step is. Well, the end result is he was fine. But his mom did. Um, he actually finished the game. We were getting close to the end. He didn't bat again. But he stayed for the rest of the game. But then his mom did take him um, to get x-rays or or whatever, but the coach of the other team came over and kind of said, it seems like he's okay. It kind of hit him in the neck, but it hit him in a, a glance, kind of a glancing hit. He'll have a bruise, but it seems like he's going to be okay. I never did get to kind of do the whole sportsmanship thing of go over, say you're sorry, and shake your hands, but I'll never forget that moment when I had lost situational awareness and pegged a kid in the throat. Dramatic. The second coming of Christ gives us situational awareness. It tells us where we are in the game. It tells us the score. It tells us what's at stake. It tells us what our responsibilities are. And at that point in, in baseball, I got to the point where no matter what happened in the game, you did something on defense. If you're an outfielder, no matter where the ball was hit, if it was an infielder, you were going in to back up the infield. If you're an infielder, you're always covering a base. You always had something to do whenever the ball was hit. The second coming of Christ tells us what our responsibility is. It tells us where we are in the scheme of things. Not just in time, but in responsibility. And when we lose the meaning and the importance of the parousia or the coming of Christ, we lose perspective. We lose focus. We lose an accurate way of understanding who Jesus is in our lives, and we fail to do our jobs. And not only do people get hurt, but people perish. We are Seventh-day Adventists. If there's any people on planet Earth who should know the situation, it's us. It's us. Now, I'm going to just share a couple of, of brief uh, perspectives that are part of the situation that should be uh, key ideas that help us in this journey that we're on. Because of our situational awareness and understanding uh, that Jesus Christ is coming again. We, above all people, should be people of hope. No matter what's going on on planet Earth, we, as we work on a day-by-day -day basis, I'm not saying this is easy. I'm not saying that discouragement can never come to us. But as we reconnect with the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, the reality of His second coming should renew in us a deep and sincere understanding of hope. You know that since the founding of our church, we've been through two world wars, right? And Jesus did not come. We should not worry whether or not World War III, World War IV, whatever is to happen, according to God's timing and God's terms, He will determine when it is right for Him to come, and we should not lose hope. It should be completely devoid of our uh, community and in general that sh we should ever come to a point of despairing and losing hope. Above all, we should be people of hope. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19 says, This hope is, our, is the anchor of our soul. I love that idea. The anchor of our soul. No matter what storms come in our life, the anchor holds us secure. And the hope that we have in Jesus Christ that He is returning one day is what keeps us uh, secure. It says that this hope is sure and steadfast, one that enters within the veil. We always know that Jesus is still on the throne of mercy. Um, growing up, about the same time, about 11 or 12 years old, one of my best friends had an older sister. Her name was Charity. And um, she was about 16 years old, and she got into a devastating car accident. Devastated. She nearly died. She was in the hospital for days. They at one point thought she might die. 
Thankfully, she didn't. She recovered, full recovery. Took a lot of weeks for her to recover from that accident. But I'll never forget how it changed them as a family. Whenever, after that, you know, before the car accident, they were a fine family. They, when, when, when they would see each other, when they would leave, oh, love you, see you when you get back, all right, you know, take care, whatever. After Charity's car accident, I have never seen a family, uh, when they would part, be more uh, 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 demonstrable than they were. Because they had this awareness, now that we're parting, the last time we parted, one of our family members almost died. And so when they would drive out of the driveway, the whole family would come out. They would wave. They would blow kisses. The one in the car would be honking the horn, rolling down the window. Love you. Bye. Love you. And I mean, I'm, I'm not mocking it at all. But I mean, I'd never seen a family be more dramatic when they would be separated from one another after charity almost died. And they did this for years, up and through when I was in high school. It didn't. I mean, I'm sure it was more intense in the beginning, but it never really faded. That reality of, I, I, I hope that we're regathered together after we're parted, but we realize that someone in our family almost died. And so when we are parted, we are that much more aware of that reality. Well, when Jesus promises that he's going to come again, when he tells his best friends in John chapter 14, don't be troubled, I'm going to heaven, but I will come again. That is his, his declaration that no matter what happens, no matter what trials go on, no matter what storms of life, no matter what tragedies are taking place, I am coming again. Therefore, we should live as people of hope more than any other people on earth. Don't let gas prices keep you down. I'm not saying be thrilled when you fill out the mortgage papers at the gas pump. Don't let the other things be real, be involved, be invested, but remember, Jesus is coming again, and that's the ultimate hope. The second coming is also one of the most divine and, and important expressions of love, and I don't know if you've ever thought of it in this context before. In, in 1 Peter, I had my Bible open here, a verse that we know very well, First, uh, 2 Peter rather, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You want to know why Jesus hasn't come yet? You want to know why Jesus doesn't come? I wish he would come today. I really do. I wish Jesus would come today. Are you ready to go to heaven? I want to be there, and I'm not trying to be arrogant like I've got everything in my life worked out and, you know, there's nothing God can do. No, I, I still trust in His grace and, 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 and uh, His redemption for sure, but I would rather be in heaven. I would rather be uh, uh, re uh, ended with the problems of sin, right? I'm tired of cancer. I'm tired of war and disease. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of autism. I'm tired of brokenness. I want Him to come now. And I'm tempted at times to get upset why he hasn't come. How much more suffering do we need? How many more pandemics? Well, you want to know why he hasn't come yet? Because there's still people open to salvation making decisions. And God cares about everyone, not just Dave Lounsbury. You know, my wife and I, there's a program on TV we like to watch. It's called Secrets of the Zoo. Right? It's all about zookeepers and animal care and things like that. And uh, they go into how they diagnose problems with animals. There are some animals, it just fascinates me. Uh, we watched one recently on bats. And they have this whole uh, cage of bats. I mean, just dozens of bats. I can't tell them apart. But the zookeepers notice that one of the bats has a tumor on his face. And so they're like, well, what do we do? This bat's got a tumor. And so they have to go into this bat enclosure and it's dangerous. Bats are not domesticated. They're not really friendly. So they have to put on all this protective gear. Then they got to catch this bat with this thing and it's flying, it's panicking and everything. Then they bring it in and they got to sedate it and, 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 you know, test it and they pull uh, blood and they've got to do all this research into it. Now, the point of this is, and, and then they have to get, you know, see, is the tumor just benign? Is it fluid? Is it cancer? Whatever. There's a hundred bats in this enclosure. I doubt the public would know if they just saw, hey, little bat number 22 has a problem. Just poop, drop it. No one would know. 
I mean, even the experts sometimes can't tell the difference between the bats. But they spend thousands of dollars and put people's lives at risk. Bats carry bacteria. They talk about, don't let the bat bite you. You're going to come down with something bad. You don't let it, don't let it scratch you. It's got all these buggies in it and whatever. They put their lives at risk. They spend thousands of dollars to help this one pathetic little bat that I don't think anyone would miss. You know, when sin erupted on planet Earth, God could have very easily just said, boop. No one's going to miss them. Just one little, one little planet, not even very many yet alive on planet Earth. Just get the pellet gun out and just end it. Start over somewhere else. No one will notice. Parousia, the second coming of Christ, the Lord's patient toward, patience towards us illustrates God is not willing that any would perish. He would pay any cost, and he will wait as long as it takes because he loves you. He loves you. So the reason why he did not come today and he's waiting is because he loves every single person. And in his divine awareness and sovereignty, he knows. He knows where every soul is. And he will wait. He will wait according to his plan so that any and all who will choose him will have that opportunity. If Jesus were to come today, there are members of my family who I worry about. So I'm okay to wait. I'm okay a little while longer because of God's love. Situational awareness, humility. We can go into a lot of areas with this, but understanding that this world is not our home, that we are just passing through. We are pilgrims. We are strangers. We are foreigners. We live in this world not to build up this kingdom, but to invest in the things that will last for eternity and to see the handwork of God before that time comes. We should be very humble. And that's what the situation tells us when we study the second coming of Christ and we realize where we are in the game. Peter continues in that same passage that I read earlier. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar. The elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness. What sort of people ought you be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. The situational awareness tells us that God is coming soon and therefore we need to be bringing our hearts in alignment with Him. We need to be abiding in Him like John told us. We need to be trusting in His grace. You know, a lot of times we wait to do the right decision until the very end. I'll study for that test, but man, I still have three days. I'll wait and study for it then, right? Or like the, the virgins who say, I've got enough oil because I'm pretty sure I know when the bridegroom's coming. So I'm just going to bring that which is enough. But they're not prepared for the fact that He was delayed in His coming. And so they, re, they run out of oil and therefore are not part of the great greeting and the time of the entrance of the bridegroom. Holiness as Seventh-day Adventists. Now this isn't about, this isn't about you know, piety and, and uh, uh, austerism. It's about a deep character development in our hearts and minds. This is what the parousia teaches us. We of all people should be devoted to a lifestyle of godliness and character that is in alignment with Jesus Christ. But last, and I think most important, and it was in um, some of the earlier uh, presentations and messages through music and other things, it's not all about us and our preparedness. When we understand the situation, when we understand the nearness and the importance of the second coming of Christ, our hearts will beat with a desire 
for the salvation of our community, with the salvation of our children, the salvation of our neighbors, the salvation of everyone truly seeking redemption and forgiveness of sins. We will be a people who use every opportunity that God brings to us as an opportunity to share the goodness of God. We will be a motivated people if we understand the situation. Whether Jesus comes tomorrow or in a hundred years, whether we are there to be translated to our immortality without seeing death, or whether, whether we have to sleep in the grave until our resurrection, it does not matter. It does not matter. We should be living lives devoted to helping other people appreciate and see Jesus Christ for who He is. If we fail in that, we have lost our situational awareness and people perish. People perish. The three angels' message that are part of the core of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists are all about the spreading of that eternal gospel. Are we Seventh-day Adventists? Do we still cherish the truth and the reality that this world is not our home, that Jesus is preparing a different world for us, and that the heartbeat of the church is to present and prepare the truth of Jesus Christ in every Sabbath school class, every VBS program, in the lunchroom at the workplace, in the classroom at school, and how we drive on the road. Does it matter? Or how much does it matter? Are you motivated because of Jesus' love for you? In the seventh volume of the testimonies, God lives and reigns. The Lord is soon coming. Talk it. Pray it. Believe it. Make it a part of the life. You will have to meet a doubting, objecting spirit, but this will give way before firm, consistent trust in God. When, perplex when perplexities or hindrances present themselves, lift the soul to God in songs and thanksgiving. Gird on the Christian armor and be sure that your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of, pe of peace. Preach the truth with boldness and fervor. Remember the Lord looks in compassion upon the field, upon this field, and that He knows its poverty and its need. The efforts you are making will not prove a failure. So church, do you have situational awareness? Are you confident where we are in the stream of this contest and this controversy we are in? Do you know what your responsibility is? Because I'm telling you, friends, the ball has been hit. It is rolling. And what we do with it from this point on will determine whether or not people are saved or people are lost. That's what the second coming teaches us. What are you going to do with it? Lord, as we consider this topic, I know there are a thousand additional elements we could talk about, signs of the times and, and uh, uh, the things that we can be aware of and watching for world events and watching out for the deception that you warn us about and the rise of earthly powers and, and all of these things, and those are worthy conversations, Father worthy Bible studies that are critical and necessary. For today, Father, I pray that this topic that we've looked at would renew our conviction into thinking eternal thoughts and not only thinking of this world. That we would not allow the politics and the world movements and the societal challenges drag us into arenas that are not essential, that would distract and distort our attention and make us lose our situational awareness. Lord, bring us back to these core eternal realities that we are a people devoted to the Advent and that our purpose as a people is not just to prepare our own hearts and be confident 
in our own salvation, but to use the strength and relationship we have with you to be conduits of that message and that opportunity to others. So, Father, that is why I believe the message of the second coming matters so much. Not just to argue about dates and symbols and interpretations, but to make deep, heartfelt commitment and reflection upon the meaning of your second coming. Lord, we don't know the date, but we do see that times are changing. And our focus needs to be on you and what you want us to do from this point forward. We want to be part of your church. We want to be part of your salvation. Lord, I pray that that's every person's commitment today. Thank you that we can be here. Bless us now on this beautiful Sabbath day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. I hope that you can come back soon. If you're going to stay with us, lunch will be ready in just a few moments. I saw the deacons uh, exit and get ready. So it's going to be a great meal together. God bless you and happy Sabbath.